So welcome to the live but not live stream. Um, everything we're saying now is being recorded. So uh, could you repeat what you... What did I say before? What I said, uh, so this is the um, uh, exam revision session for 2019 term two, and we'll be going through the 2019 term one exam okay. for Math 1231. Uh, it's also relevant for Math 1241. Uh, the exam has changed format this year. It used to be four questions, now it's only three. Um, we essentially removed the first question, so if you want to look at past exam papers, the first question, things in the first question are relevant, but they're a little bit easier perhaps than they uh, are in the exam coming up. So it's more, this exam is more like questions two, three, and four. You still have the same amount of time as previously, two hours, so you've just got more time for questions two, three, and four instead of doing the one at the beginning. And the reason for that is that the lab tests we have now are sort of repeatable and have covered a lot of the basic stuff already. You should be pretty close to having passed the term already uh, and don't uh, so the exam is only 50 percent used to be 60 so this, this changed a little bit for those reasons and uh, we'd like to just have a few more questions that are uh, it's a little bit more the exam is slightly tougher than it was in the past but uh, the stuff you're doing during the term is sort of easier now i was looking at the old exam paper on the front it did say you are also you, your answers are supposed to be correct but also well written that's right yes so we we will be that is something you need to take into consideration yes. when you're writing up your solutions not not as much as for the assignment um no, no. but certainly uh you should try to write things down that make uh sense and it's not just about scratching down the answer that you've uh, you've got to by some means but try to try to uh, write what you're you know write an explanation of what you're doing but again, uh, you know, it's only a two-hour exam, so obviously not like the assignment, but you do have a little bit more time than in the previous uh, exams. Yeah. Right, so I think you'll start with 1A? Uh, sure. Okay, so we'll, um, we've will we got uh, question 1A. Are you going to put it on the screen? Uh, yeah. I might put it where you can see it too. Okay. Uh -huh. So just wait for that to come up on the screen. So uh, the question says, suppose that f is a function of two variables, um, z equals uh, f of x, y, so f is a function of two variables. If uh, x equals u cos v and y equals u sine v, find an expression for the z by the v. Okay, so we need to use the chain rule here. Okay, so which side am I writing on? This side. This side over here. Okay, so um, maybe starting about here, let's just get that right. Okay, so we've got z is um, f of u v. I'm on the screen here, and um, I'll just write down a bit of the data. X equals u cos v, and y equals u shine v. And we want to know what is dz by the v. Have I got that right? Okay. Uh, we want that in terms of u and v. Okay, so we need a, a chain rule here. So uh, if, uh, let's, let's just write this down. So this is going to be um, uh, dz uh, by, sorry, I've written, <laughs> made a typo already. This is z equals f of xy. All right, that's better. Um, so we want uh, to find dz by dv. It's dz by dx and then dx by dv plus dz by dy dy by dv. Okay, so because z depends on two variables x and y, its dependence on v goes through each of those until we have two terms. Okay, so now it's just a matter of writing down uh, what we can here, and the question asks us to find this in terms of partial derivatives of f. So first of all, z is just um, uh, z is just essentially f, so this is df by dx, uh, z by dx is df by dx, and uh, dz by dv, we can just use the formula we have up here. We just need to know that's u shine v, and the next one, dz by dy is uh, df by dy, and um, y is u shine v, so this is, uh, we're differentiating with respect to v, so this is u cosh v. I think that's... Is that all done? Yep. That's good. Okay, so that is... Let's see my camera. 
Okay. Uh, the partial derivative. Uh, you do need to know how to do your uh, chain rules for multivariable functions. Um, yes, these are all partial derivatives because they all depend on more than one variable. That's right, so. it depends on more than one variable, yes. And everything is written out in terms of the, uh, the partial derivative of f. Yeah, makes sense there. All right, so okay. I'll go on with part b. Sure. Do you want me to rub this off while you're... Sure, I'll get on screen. Okay, so we have a surface, and here it's defined implicitly in terms of a function. And we're asked to show that at the point 1, 4, 9, that this vector given here is actually a normal vector to the surface. So I think what I want to do is I want to write this down uh, and work out... I do want to write this down and try and work out a normal vector there and show that this is just parallel to that normal vector somehow. So so I think I will now, this isn't G in terms, this isn't like X in terms of a function. Maybe I ask, might ask your advice. Should yes. I so, solve for this one in terms of? Uh, so there's two, I guess, two methods uh, that you might have seen for finding the normal vector. Mm -hmm. One of them is the one we emphasize in the notes and that would be to solve uh, for Z as a function of X and Y mm -hmm. and then use the formula with df dx df dy and minus one yeah the other would be to set uh, a function new function of three variables g to be equal to x to the half plus y to the half plus z to the half mm. and yeah take. calculate the partial derivatives of that so that one is only in an example and a sort of hidden bit in the notes and some tutors might have shown you that but it's not the one that's emphasized no so i might do the one that's emphasized yeah i can actually solve for z in terms of x okay. and y so all right, let's look at our surface and let's try and just Mark off the space I cannot write. Very close. So we can solve. Oh, well, I don't like that expression. Let's say we can express the surface as Z. Well, I really just want to solve this expression for z. I can do that by taking z to the half is 6 minus the square root of y and the square root of z, and then squaring all that. So all together, I get that z is really just uh, 6 and it's the square root of x minus the square root of y squared. And I'm told we have a point on that surface. It's the point one four nine. I'll just double check that point is really on the surface. So when x is one, um, the point is one four nine. Mm -hmm. Z would be 9. Mm -hmm. I guess it is right. Okay, yes. Because when I plug it in, this is 6 minus 1 minus 2. So it's 3 squared. So this really is a point on the surface. So I just wanted to double check that. All right. So. Now, what we can use is the tangent plane approximation, which does give us a nice planar approximation at a, at a point. So from the tangent, tangent plane approximation, well, what do we have? We have that, well, the tangent plane would be given by uh, z is approximately the function at the point 
one four. What's the slope at the point one four? Times the difference between x and one and the slope at the point one four. Between x, uh, y, and four. Now, what's nice is if you rearrange this, you can immediately pull out a tangent vector. And maybe I didn't need to write this down because this is the part that you should probably know. But I did want to point right out where it came to, where it came from. So you can see that this tangent plane approximation has normal vector. Normal is given by the slope in the x direction. Well, at the point one four. Uh, did I actually ever set what f was? I think I was quite naughty and never said what f was. So f is this combination here. Let's see partial derivatives of this in the direction x and y, and minus 1 for the final component. So if you do calculate this, so the partial derivative here is fairly easy to take. It's going to be, well, the derivative of a square is nice. It's just twice that square. Oh, sorry, twice that variable. I'm going to multiply that by the derivative of the inside, which is going to be minus 1 over 2 root x. Uh, the next derivative is going to be 2. Again, this derivative of a square is fairly easy. And then the derivative of the inside, the partial derivative with respect to y, is going to be minus 1 over 2 root y minus 1. And this is all evaluated at x, y equals 1, 4. Now, let me just see if I'm still on the screen. Yep. So if I plug this all in, this does give me, uh, I can just calculate what this normal vector I've constructed is. So frankly, I know this number in here is just a 3. So it's 2 times 3 times minus 1 over 2. The next part will be two times three times minus one over four and a minus one for the final component. Yeah. So have we shown that uh, six three two is a no, that's the next part. So this is a normal vector. It's not the normal vector I was asked to show, but it is parallel to it. So that is, I might just write this in a little bit of a cleaner way. That is, we have normal vector. Well, the normal vector I found is the vector minus 3 minus 3 over 2 minus 1. And because I know what I want to actually show this is parallel to, I might just point out this is actually minus 1 half what I want. What I wanted was 6, 3, 2. So this is a normal vector. It's parallel to a normal. Hence the vector 632 is also a normal, just because it is parallel to the normal I constructed. So every normal vector you find will be parallel to this one, so there'll be some multiple which will make it into that vector. So part two, well, actually, I guess I kind of did part two, because it says hence write down the Cartesian equation of the tangent plane the surface. And that's kind of where I started. 
Now I might, you could just use this formula here. This is the Cartesian equation of the tangent plane. But if you weren't able to do that, if you didn't have the tangent plane approximation, there is actually still a way to do it using the information provided. So I might just quickly do that. So even if you were stuck for part one, part two can be done with the information we've told you. So one way you could do this is we have a point and we have a normal. If I want a Cartesian equation for a plane, the most obvious thing to do is point normal form. So I might write that. So for part two, I'll do it this way. We can use <clears throat> so we can use point normal form. To get the plane equation, the equation describing the plane. I might slip in the word tangent. So the tangent plane equation. Well, it's going to be the normal, which in this case is 6, 3, 2. It could be any normal, but let's use the one they provided. And then the difference between the points we're looking at and the actual points on the surface are the x minus 1, y minus 4, and z minus 9 equals 0. And I'm, well, some people might argue that's not Cartesian equation, so I'm just going to write this in the equivalent way of 6 times x minus 1. So that is 6 times x minus 1 plus 3 times y minus 4 plus 2 times z minus 9 equals 0. So that is an equation, a Cartesian equation for the tangent plane. So... Would it might be nice to expand that? Usually you'd see it written, written, out, written out as uh, 6x plus 3y plus 2z equals something, which has got to be the rest of it, isn't it? Yes. Well, another way to do this is okay. you do get it by yeah. right. So 6 plus 12 plus 18. 6 plus 12 plus 18. Should be able to do that one. Yes. Is that 32? 6, uh, yeah. 6 plus 12 is 18. Plus another 18. It's 36. 36, yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's, uh, that's all done. I, um, so the solution that we've seen here probably could be done a little bit quicker in the exam. You can um, uh, write down the function f, differentiate with respect to x and y, put it straight into that formula. Um, that would be fine. You could probably streamline this a bit. Uh, but that's, that's all good. Okay, so should we go on to the next question? Sure. I'll just run this up. Okay, so this is an integral. Um, and uh, so what we're integrating is 1 over x times x squared plus 1. And um, there's actually a number of ways you can do this. You can do this integral with uh, trick substitutions, I think. But uh, the idea here is that you probably want to, um, uh, well, this integral, the typical uh, rational function, you want to decompose into partial fractions. So let's do that. Um, what we have here is uh, a linear factor. On, it's already factorized. The numerator, sorry, the denominator is already factorized. So we just need to split it up according to these factors. The first one here is a linear factor. And the second one is a quadratic that can't be um, uh, factored into linear factors, at least not real ones. So the form of the partial fraction we would need would be something like this, a constant over the linear factor plus something uh, of the form or like bx plus c over the quadratic factor. And um, it's quite typical uh, that you would need to be able to decompose something like this into partial fractions. That's probably the uh, most important thing to know. And 
here it's uh, very important to know that if you've got a quadratic, irreducible quadratic on the bottom, you need to have something with an x on the top, bx plus c, or something like that. So we want to try and find out what a, b, and c are. Um, if you can just guess what they are and get it right, that's fine. But there's a sort of systematic way you can do this. Uh, there's a number of different systematic ways, but I would multiply throughout by um, the denominator to make it into a polynomial equation, which would be 1 equals a x squared plus 1 uh, plus bx plus c times x, like so, and then try to figure out what a, b, and c are by various means. You can just substitute some values for x, or you could pick off coefficients. I think it's pretty easy to see here that, that on the right-hand side, the only constant term comes from a times 1. And so um, that's got to match the constant term on the left. So uh, I might just make a little note of this. So this is the constant on the left is 1, and the constant on the right is a. So a equals 1. That's pretty quick. Uh, and then the coefficient of x squared uh, is 0 on the left. And on the right, it's a plus b. There's ax squared here, and there's bx times x over here. So that tells us uh, immediately, since we already know that a is 1, b has to be minus 1. And the coefficient of x is um, 0 on the left. There's no x on the left, but then on the right, there's a, a c times x. So the coefficient of x on the right is c. So c equals 0. So we've pretty quickly worked out that uh, we can decompose this um, up here uh, as, maybe I'll just write it up here, using this stuff. Uh, so a is 1, so this is 1 over x, uh, c is 0 and b is minus 1, so it's minus x over x squared plus 1. I'm still on the screen. Alright, so now we know how to do this integral. So the integral, um, the integral of 1 over x, x squared plus 1 dx is the integral of 1 over x minus x over x squared plus 1. And these you should be able to just do straight away. Uh, the integral of 1 over x is the natural log of the absolute value of x. And uh, then we've got minus a half log of x squared plus 1 plus c. You could use some log laws to rewrite them in a different way. This could become the log of uh, the square root of x squared plus 1, and then maybe you can combine these with uh, as, a, as the log of the absolute value of x divided by the square root of x squared plus 1. Um, but that's, uh, I think it's fine to find the way it is. Okay, so that's that one done. Maybe I'll just do the next one because it's so quick. Maybe before you do that, there's oh. always something I like to point out about this particular thing. Yeah. There's, well, it is, it's, it's, there is a mistake I sometimes see people make that's to leave out, well, not remember. Leave out one of those two terms. Leave yeah. out one of these two terms. Yeah. Um, frankly, it's very hard here because this would be the term that would be forgotten, so actually you do need that. The one thing I do like to sometimes think about when I see this is to think about what it is you're trying to match. So one thing is that if you look more generally at this right-hand side, so this, uh, I'd like to think, well, that's a cubic on the bottom. So I like to think you could fit uh, a quadratic on top, so just with some other parameter names. Uh, but one last thing I'd like to notice is I'm more confident in my guess because here I can have up to three different uh, variables in it, so alpha, beta, gamma. And here I need an A, B, and a C. So at least the numbers match, and I'm a bit more confident. If I'm missing one of the parameters, it will at least show up here. I I need three, and I have three, so I'm fairly happy with what I've written down. That's just something I like to think about when I do these things. Okay, do you want to just put the next one on the screen? Um, yeah. Or maybe I can just, I can probably, while I rub this off, put it up.
Okay, so the next one is just, uh, it's a very, very quick one. It's just asking whether or not a particular series converges. And this is just really testing whether or not you uh, just have your fingertips. A very, very important fact that, um, the fact being that the, the sum, this is for our n from 1 to infinity of 1 over n to the s, this um, diverges for a particular value, particular values of s, and it converges for some other values of s, and you need to know which ones. And the way I like to remember this is there's a very special, um, well-known uh, series that sort of divides the two cases, and that is the harmonic series, where it's uh, where it's one over just just one over n, where s where s is one. S equals one is the sort of dividing line between the two possible cases. Um, if you uh, have numbers that are even bigger than the terms one over n, then it's also going to diverge. And so the ones that are bigger are when this power is is less than one. So it diverges for s less than or equal to one, and it converges for s greater than one. So if you know those facts, um, then uh, then it's immediately uh, clear whether this diverges or converges because uh, s equals two thirds. So since since s equals two thirds, and that's less than or equal to one, um, the series converges. I think that's that's all we need to say. This this is a, a very important sort of base case around which you can make comparisons uh, in order to decide whether other series converge. But this one, this question is just very quick. All you need to say here was that note that s is two thirds and two thirds is a number less than or equal to one. So it's well known that such a series uh, diverges. Did I write converges? Does this diverge or converge? Yeah, it diverges. Yeah. Okay. Everybody. <laughs> diverges. I had it written up here and then I wrote the wrong word down there. Okay. Okay, so the next one? Yes, I guess that's why it's good to give reasons. Yes. Because, uh, especially if you tell the general test, you definitely yeah. know what's going on and you definitely want to give you the marks. Yeah. I, I, would have, would, I might have got the marks because I wrote the right thing down here. But. Yeah. Okay. Me to take this one? Sure. Oh, maybe I'll do it while I'm here. Okay, so we've got a linear transformation, and we've got the uh, we've got the property that uh, we know. Well, we know how it transforms two particular two particular vectors in R two. It's a it's a transformation from R two to R three, and we know how it transforms two particular vectors in R two, and so we want to find a general formula. Well, as it uh, turns out, the two vectors we know about, 1, 0, and 2, 3, that's the ones I've been seeing over here on the left, um, those two vectors uh, form a basis for R2. So we know how T acts on everything if we know how it acts on a basis, and so we'd like to take advantage of that. So to find a general formula, I guess we need to write um, the vector xy as a linear combination of the two vectors we do know about. Because we know that linear transformations, the main thing about linear transformations is that they preserve linear uh, linear combinations. So if we know how to write x, y like this, and then we apply t to it, well, we can just take the t into act on here and the t to act on here, and then we've got an answer. Okay, so uh, how, do we, how do we write down this? Well, uh, this, I guess this is a system of linear equations. We want to find alpha and beta uh, such that this is true. So we're trying to solve um, x is equal to alpha plus 2 beta and y equals 3 beta. Zero lots of alpha. So, we, so the first equation, the first component x is equal to 1 lot of alpha plus 2 lots of beta and the second equation is y equals 0 lots of alpha plus 3 lots of beta. Okay. So can we solve these? Well, actually, that's pretty easy uh, because um, the second equation here tells us that beta should be a third of y. 
we're trying to solve for alpha and beta here. We're trying to if someone gave you x and y, you want to know what alpha and beta are. So I'm trying to solve for alpha and beta. Beta is clearly a third of y. Um, okay, beta is one third of y. And uh, so then, what is x? So we can just plug that back into the original, back into this other equation. So we sorry, what is beta? What is alpha? Uh, this equation here says that alpha is x minus 2 beta uh, and beta is a third third of y okay uh, two thirds of y all right so that means that um, x y is equal to uh, x minus two thirds of y times by one zero. I hope you're checking this Joshua. <laughs> uh, plus one third of uh, y times two thirds. We can just check that we've got this right. Um, the first component should come out to x. So we've got x times x minus two thirds of y times one plus a third of y times two. And that's going to cancel with that. Yes, that's good. And for the second component, we've got nothing here, and a third times 3y is just y. Okay, so therefore, t of xy is t of all of this stuff. Maybe I should write it down. I think this pen's getting a bit dodgy. Okay, and because t is linear, that means that this is x minus two thirds of y times t acting on one zero plus one third of y times t acting on two three, and these are the things that we've been told in the um, information from the question. Uh, so the first one, this is x minus two thirds y times 1, 4 minus 1 plus 1 third y times 5 minus 1, 1. Okay, so now I've worked out a general formula for it. Maybe we want to simplify this. Um, uh, maybe I'll just write it over here. Um, so t of x, y is equal to the first component. Uh, how many lots of x do we have in it? We've got x times 1. And how many lots of y? We've got minus 2 thirds y plus 5 thirds y. So that's 3 thirds y. And the second component is uh, we've got x times 4. And how many lots of y do we have? We've got minus 2 thirds times 4 thirds, that's minus 8 thirds, minus another third, minus 9 thirds, minus 3y. And the last one we've got minus x. And how many lots of y? Um, Two thirds of y minus two thirds y plus minus one. Two thirds of y plus one third of y is three thirds of y, which I think is one lot of y. Okay, so I think that's that's the uh, the answer there. Um, maybe maybe you might like to you know keep writing it in all sorts of different ways. I don't know. One or minus one plus. So x times 1, 4 minus 1, plus y times 1, minus 3, 1. I think at this point here, uh, you know, we've gone beyond what we need to, to to actually answer the question. Probably just stopping there would be an answer to the question. But, uh, yeah. No? Okay, what do you reckon? I guess the good thing is, if you do get to this point, you can now easily check your answer. 
which you could see if it does actually do what it's supposed to. If we put in one zero, it definitely yeah. does put out the right vector. Oh now, yes, yep. If putting in so if you if you want uh, if you want the vector one zero, that's x equals one, y equals zero. And x equals one, y equals zero gives you four, sorry, one, four minus one, which was the what it's supposed to do from up here. Um, and if you put in what do we want to get for the other one? Two, three. Minus equals two and plus three. So two yeah. plus three is five, yes. We get eight. Uh, so we're gonna get eight minus nine is minus one, good. And uh, minus two plus three is one. So yes, it does actually. Work. X equals two, y plus three gives you the other other vector. Yeah. Now there was okay. one other way. I mean, I guess maybe uh, there is one other way I thought of doing this, which is to work out what it does on the other standard basis vector. But, uh, okay. So you, what you might want to do is to work out how to write uh, the, the vector zero one mm. in terms of one zero and two three. Two, three. Yes. Which doesn't seem too hard. So maybe that's another method that we could. Yeah. Do you want to do that? Yeah, I might do that. So another thing that jumped to mind is... Nice to do all this. Uh, sure. <laughs> so when I'm looking at this question, I'm thinking, I know this matrix representation theorem, which essentially says to know what the linear map does, you just need to know what it does on the standard basis vectors. Now we already have actually one, the action on one standard basis vector. I know where t of 1, 0 goes. So what I would really love is to know where t of 0, 1 goes. And actually, that looks like it's not too hard to work out if this is a linear map. So, and this is maybe it trying to be a little bit creative. We're thinking, I can see, or we can see, so we can see, so this is just an observation right now, that if I wanted to make the vector 0, 1, well, I could get it. Well, let's say I took the vector I knew, 2, 3, and subtracted off two lots of 1, 0. Well, it's not quite 0, 1, because that's going to give me 0, 3, but I can have one third of some high thing. That means I could have one third of 2, 3, minus two thirds of 1, 0. So this is just an observation, something which I think is nice, because I have knowledge about what the map does for these. And now because it's a linear map, I know what, if I, I, well, I can just use the linear property to get to look at what happens to t0, 1. So from the linearity, it's a, bit, a linear map, we get that t of 0, 1 is actually going to be 1 third T of I did write it right of two three minus two thirds of T of one zero. Things that I have written on the page. So according to this, maybe we should have left yours up, but anyway. <laughs> uh, according to this, this will be one third of oh, must make sure I get this the right way around. It's maybe silly to swap the order. 5 minus 1, 1, minus 2 thirds of 1, 4, minus 1. Now, if this is all done correctly, well, I think it's a factor of a third, so I'm going to ignore that and say 5 minus 2, minus 1, minus A. And one plus two, which does seem different from what you worked out before. I don't remember there being a nine there. Oh yeah, I had a nine. Yeah, you did. A, okay. Because there's a three in the middle. Oh, and there is a. Um, you're right. I'm missing the one third. So actually, having future knowledge doesn't help. There's a three, a minus nine, and a three. So this will be the vector one minus three, one. So now I know what this does. Now it's actually fairly easy to finish the question because I know how to write x, y in terms of 1, 0, and 0, 1. So you could just finish it now. Hence the map acting on x, y. Well, it is the map acting on x times, oops, acting on x times 
acting on 0, 1 plus, sorry, x times 0, 1 plus y times x times 1, 0, one, zero, zero 1. What I'm writing, not what I'm saying, <laughs> unfortunately. So this would be t x 1, 0, which we were told, and y t 0, 1, which we just worked out. So that would be x times what we're told, which is 1, 4, minus 1, plus y times what we worked out, which is here, 1, minus root 1. Which is nice, because this is exactly what I think Jonathan ended up with yep. before. Mm -hmm. And this is... Uh, Another way to do it. Yeah. Probably, uh, it's important actually to understand all these different ways to do it, because I think this is a little bit easier. Uh, and certainly the questions in the exam coming up this term where uh, you can do it the, um, uh, you know, grind it out the hard way, or you can, uh, if you understand what you're doing, there's actually shortcuts, and uh, that's really uh, I think helpful. Yeah, even just to do it the way Jonathan did, you do have to understand what you're doing, that you have to express that vector in terms of stuff you know. Yeah, so and here yeah. I'd like to just get some other yeah. stuff which uh, I find easy. And the important thing about linear maps is that they preserve linear combinations. They, they go through linear combinations like that. That's, that's really what linear maps are about. So, you know, questions which bring that out are, are what questions we like. Okay. All right. Actually, I'm on a roll here. Can I do the next one? Sure. You can go and uh, switch, switch the screen over to the rest of the next question. Okay, so we've got uh, a matrix A, and we're given we're given uh, some vectors that are eigenvectors of A, and the first part asks us to find the eigenvalues of A corresponding to those eigenvectors. Okay, so this is um, uh, this is F, and we'll do part one first. Okay, so so now here, I guess this is another question where if you know what you, uh, what what things mean, then you can do this very quickly. So. Um, you know, if you're given a matrix and you want to find eigenvectors and eigenvalues with no information at all, the first thing you would do would be to find eigen, eigenvalues by solving the characteristic equation and then for each of those try to find the eigenvectors. But here we're given the eigenvectors and we know, uh, if we know that what an eigenvector means, we can just immediately use the property to find the eigenvalue. An eigenvector means, uh, so if B1 is an eigenvector of A, then A times B1 is a multiple of B1 and that multiple is the eigenvalue. So let's just calculate that. So we want to calculate a times b1. Uh, just write this out. So this is 8, 1, minus 4, 3, times by b1. Just doing the matrix multiplication, row times column. So it's uh, 8 minus 1 is 7. And uh, minus 4 times 1 plus 3 times minus 1 is minus 7. And this, uh, yes, it is, uh, certainly has to be a multiple of the vector because we're told it's an eigenvector. This is 7 times 1 minus 1. And so that 7 is the eigenvalue. So we found one of them. I'll write that down in a minute, but I'll just uh, work out A times B2. A times B2 is um, 1 minus 4. So, okay, so it's 8 times 1 plus 4 times minus 1, so that's 4, and uh, minus 4 minus, uh, minus 12 is minus 16, and this is 4 times our original vector. So there's the eigenvalue corresponding to this eigenvector. So um, find the eigenvalues corresponding of A corresponding to the two eigenvectors we're given. So um, the eigenvalue corresponding to B1, that's the first one, is 7. And, and the eigenvalue corresponding to B2 is 4. Okay. So that's that done. Um, so this, that is, again, this was really quick and simple. If you uh, understood what eigenvectors and eigenvalues mean, um, 
if you were to go through trying to find the eigenvalues, you would find that you'd solve, you know, you've got then the character's equation would be quadratic, you would solve it and find four and seven as the roots. That still, still wouldn't be finished because you wouldn't know which one corresponded to which eigenvector. You'd have to um, solve some equations to, to work that out. So this is much, much simpler. Okay, now part B, sorry, part B, part two, asks us to prove uh, that every uh, vector in R2 um, can be written as a linear combination of eigenvectors of A. So here there's lots of ways you could sort of phrase this, uh, lots of results you could use, but essentially the key point is that uh, the two eigen... Uh, we have two eigenvectors of A, 1 minus 1 and 4 minus 4. These uh, two vectors are linearly independent and a set of two linearly independent vectors in R2 um, forms a basis, which means that every vector can be written as a linear combination of them. So you just need to write down some some combination of things like that to uh, to to explain this. So um, we know that um, one minus one and one minus four are eigenvectors of A and also they are linearly independent. Linearly independent vectors in R2. Um, R2 is a two-dimensional vector space, so any pair, any two, any two linearly independent vectors forms a basis. Any two linear independent vectors in R2 form a basis for R2 and hence any vector in R2 can be written as a linear combination. Um, of, or maybe I'll write down explicitly. Okay, so there's lots of different ways you could you could explain explain this fact, but it's essentially falls down to the same point. We've got two uh, linearly independent vectors in R2, so any vector in R2 can be written as a linear combination of them. Happy with that? Yeah, just remind people I'm here. I might say, yeah, this is good. Um, I think it, it all will come down to the same thing. You want some information saying that these are linearly independent, that they do form a basis. I suppose I haven't said what linearly independent means and proved they're linearly independent. No, I think that's what we're... Yeah. I think... But we... Yeah. One thing we want you to know is that different eigenvalues do give you linearly independent vectors. There's no yeah. way for two vectors with... Uh, the diff there's no way for two vectors with different eigen... Two, sorry, two eigenvectors with different... with two... Distinct eigenvalues. Distinct eigenvalues to be linearly dependent. It's a very important fact that they are always linearly independent. So this question, you know, one of the things you could, be, you could think it's testing on, on is this piece of knowledge, which is yeah. quite a useful piece of knowledge. Um, I could imagine other ways you could argue that these two are linearly independent. Yeah, of course. Well. You could just show one it is not a multiple of the other. If yes. you've got two vectors and one's not a multiple of the other, then they're linearly independent. But the question does say prove. So we want you to explain why you know that. So here it's nice because we know there are eigenvectors with different eigenvalues. Uh, there are other reasons you could be giving. Yeah. Um, carry on with the next one. Yeah, you can do this one. I'll, I'll just uh, rub all this stuff off. Okay. 
There's so a this lot is, of stuff on this. Uh, yes, this is a very busy slide. There's a lot of information that we're being provided. Um, maybe you want to go uh, try control <laughs> what's on the screen. So we are given a lot of Maple output, and this is actually good because the Maple output is doing a lot of work for us. So it says, look, we've given you all this work, it's being done for you. Now we want you to explain how, the, how these calculations can be used to answer uh, the questions we're giving. What do you want me to do here? Um, let's see. So should we try and... Yeah, it's very hard to control that. <laughs> you want it bigger? Uh, maybe it's fine the size it is. If, you, if you're having trouble reading this, remember this is question 1 part G from the 2019 term 1 exam, so you could just go look at the original source and see what it says. But we have this matrix A, and the first part is we need to find a basis for the kernel of A. Now quite nicely, they've already defined A in the code, and they've actually done a linear solve command. They want to find everything which when you multiply by A gives you the zero vector. So this is the definition of the kernel. Um, so the, it's already telling us what the solution space looks like. We just need to understand how that gives us a basis. So let's see, g part i, how about g part i? So we want to find the basis. So from the output, well, I do want to use the output. We see that the solutions of a x equal to zero are, well, they're the following linear combination. So they give us these parameters t5 and t4. I'm just going to uh, rename those to something a little bit more familiar. So I'm going to call t5 alpha and so this really can be written as alpha times 1 minus 3 0 0 1 and I'm going to call t4 beta and if you look this can be written as minus 1 times beta minus 1 0 1 0 so this is just reading the code and saying, what is the code really telling me? What is the output really telling me? Well, it's telling me that the solutions to this, this question, ax equals zero, look like this. And these two linearly independent vectors, uh, they do give me a basis for the kernel. So I can just, I think, just state what we see. Hence, a basis for the kernel of A, so that the solutions to this equation, a basis is the following. So it's the vector 1 minus 3, 0, 0, 1, with the vector minus 1, minus 1, 0, 1, 0. And it's quite common to give this uh, curly bracket notation to define a basis. Um, now step two is write down what the rank of A is. Now there is more than one way to do this, looks like I have a little bit of space down here. So one of them is the rank nullity theorem because this actually tells me the nullity of the matrix, it tells me the, the dimension of the kernel. I could use the rank nullity theorem for that. I could also look at this row reduce matrix here and see how many of the columns of A are linearly independent. And these would um, allow me to work out the dimension of the image. I think I might just do it using the rank nullity theorem. That seems like a simple way to do it. So part two, we have, well, I'm looking for the nullity of A. And just to be very explicit, this is the dimension of the kernel of A. And I already know the kernel is spanned 
are two linearly independent vectors. So the kernel is two-dimensional. So we have that just from part A. So I can use the rank nullity theorem, hence by the rank nullity theorem. Well, people state it in different ways. I like to state it as the rank plus the nullity is the number of columns. Here I'm going to rearrange that to the rank of A is equal to the number of columns of A, which is something we can count, minus the nullity of A. So there were five columns in A, and the nullity is two, so therefore the rank is three. The dimension of the image is three. So that's not the only way to do it. You can also get this using the Gaussian elimination. Now part three says, well, find a basis for R5, but we really like A as a matrix, so you want to include as many of the columns from A. So it has to be a basis, but you also have to include as many columns as possible from the matrix A. And this is what we really need part B for. Uh, any comments before I wrap this out, Jonathan? Uh, no, I like I like the fact of using the rank nullity theorem because that uh, very important result and makes makes life easier here. Yeah. I've never seen a notation for the number of columns, so I always just write it out as yeah. a sentence. Um, so here, hash for number. Is it the dimension of the, the um, domain? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah, yeah, dimension of the. I'd call it the dimension of domain, probably. Okay. So, so all the other quantities in there are dimensions of some space. That's the one. Yeah. The, the rank nullity theorem says that the dimension, the domain, the dimensions in the domain get sort of divided between the image and the kernel. Yes. So here's where you're yeah. definitely thinking of the um, A as the linear map. So yeah. you're thinking matrix is really a linear map. Yeah. Okay, so for part B, well, again, all the calculations are done. We just need to know how to get the information out. This is part three. Find a basis. Now looking at this, well the trouble is um, the, third, the fourth and the fifth column, so if you look at the row reduction, it really tells me that the fourth and the fifth column are linearly dependent on the first three, so they, don't, they can be dropped if you're trying to construct the basis. So I might just say from the uh, Gaussian elimination we see that well I'm going to firstly just say what is the basis I'm going to pick so we see that the columns so we need the uh, I want to take going to this, the first three columns of A, and I also want to take, I need to really put a dotted line in here, because Maple doesn't support the augmenting line, so I'm putting that in myself and saying, all right, so first three columns of A, and then I want the first two columns of the identity matrix. That'll be my basis. So these all, these will, yeah, these will form my basis. Uh, basis we're looking for is going to be the basis containing the vector. Now make sure you do pull out the columns of A, not the row reduced one. Because this is all good information, but it's not really A. It's just some information about A. It says I want the 
the first three columns of A. And according to the code, what they've augmented with is the 555 identity matrix. And according to this, I need the first two columns of the 555 identity matrix, which is these two. Now I'm fairly happy. I'm fairly happy with this as an answer. The only thing I think I could add to make it even better is to just remark on why I had to drop those last two. So I might add that just to make myself happy. So we couldn't take the fourth and fifth. Of A because these were linearly dependent on the first. So I did take the first three columns, but the fourth and the fifth, I can't take them, they are linearly dependent. And I just needed these two. To complete my basis. Right. I believe that's actually the end of question one, is it? Uh, yes. Yeah, so question one. Or part G. Part G. Is there a part F? Maybe there is a part F. I can't see the. Uh, no, there isn't. We're going to part. We're going to question two now. Right. Yes, question two. Part Plus two. H comes after G anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. Well, I'll, 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 I'll give this one a go. Just switch. I'll do that one. Just switch the. Okay. So um, now we're just doing a sort of standard integral. And um, okay, so I'll just uh, so the integral we've got um, is the integral from zero to two pi of some uh, powers of sine and and cos. And um, I guess the first thing you want to do is just well, we, you should have seen these integrals before, and uh, we just want to sort of massage it into a form where we can do the integral. Um, the standard trick here is because it's an odd power of sine, we can just take off one sine uh, and then we'll be left with an even power of sine which we can convert into cosine. So I won't uh, say too much about this, but this is um, a sort of standard, standard trick to rewrite it like I'm doing here. So you can see I've split up the sine cubed into a sine, a sine squared and a sine. And um, having done that, then um, this here, sine x, is essentially the derivative of cos x, or it is the derivative of cos x, and everything else here can be written in terms of cos x. It's not quite done yet because we need to um, convert that sine squared x into 1 minus cos squared x. And then we can do the integration. This is just a polynomial in cos x. Now you could do a variable substitution, uh, change of um, change of variables, or you could uh, just do it uh, by by inspection. So at this point you should be able to do it by inspection. We've got um, one third cos cubed x minus one fifth cos to the fifth x from zero to two pi. And that's pretty easy to evaluate. Uh, are you sure about that? No, I'm not sure about that at all. So this is actually where I might want to point out something. I, actually, I think uh, the causes were fine. Hang on. Cos was fine. Cos, hang on. What have I done wrong? 
So this is one thing I like to do when I do these integrals, is I like to take the derivative of this, just to make sure it really is going to give me this. The derivative of cos... Derivative of cos is minus sign. Yes. Uh -huh. So that's why I always double check. Yes, right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so... Um, uh, so the derivative of cos is minus sine of this. Yeah, this is right. Okay, so now we have... Um, uh, now we can evaluate this at pi over 2. The cosine of pi over 2 is 0. This is 0 minus 0, and the cosine of 0 is 1. So this is then minus 1 third minus 1 fifth. So overall, what have we got? We've got plus a third minus a fifth. Uh, so that's... Um, is that 2 on 15? Try to give us a bit of room. I got that right? Yes. In fact, this would be a good point. If you had made your mistake, maybe I should have let you keep going. Yeah, because I would have got a negative answer, wouldn't I? And up here, everything in this integral is between 0 and 2 pi, all of these things are positive. Yes, yeah, yeah. so maybe I should have let him go uh, see what would happen. Oh well, yeah. next time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Um, for part, that was part one. Part two. Um, part two is uh, the integral from zero to two of x, sorry, is that x cubed times the square root of four minus x squared dx. And um, so. Let's, let's make a substitution, I think. Think something like this here, to get rid of a square root, you typically want to make a substitution. Um, there are trig substitutions you can do and hyperbolic trig substitutions you can do. Essentially, you want to uh, construct some sort of identity that, um, that makes this into a perfect square, so the square root disappears. Um, when you've got something minus x squared, it's pretty likely that sine or cosine is, is a good substitution to make here. And, um, I guess given that this is part two of a question in part one where there was a started with an integral with sine cubed, you know, may, maybe we want to choose choose it so that this x ends up here being sine cubed. Okay, now we want to we want to make this into a perfect square, so we're going to have to have four minus four um, sine squared there in order to factor out the four. So I'm going to make a choice uh, which is the following. So let's choose. Choose x squared to be 4 um, sine squared theta. If that x squared is 4 sine squared theta, a factor of 4 comes out the front, and we've got 1 minus sine squared, which becomes cos squared, and then the square root disappears. So, of course, this, uh, well, there's two choices how you could make x squared into that, plus or minus, but let's just choose the simple one. And then dx is uh, 2 cos theta d theta. And if x equals 0, then we're going to want uh, theta to be 0. Well, it doesn't quite imply theta equals 0, but that's a good choice. Uh, we can take theta starting at 0. There's obviously other places uh, where which give us 0, but that one will do. And with x equals 2, that doesn't quite imply that. Uh, maybe this is slightly wrong to say it implies that, but I'm making a choice here. Uh, let's take theta to be pi over 2. So we're going from uh, 0 to pi over 2. Okay, and I think I've got room over here to do some working. So the integral we have becomes um, becomes the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of sine cubed theta times the square root of 4 minus 4 sine squared theta. Uh, and dx is 2 sine theta d theta. Oh, 2 cos, making the mistakes again. 2 cos theta d theta. And so what happens here? So we've got um, uh, here this 4 comes out the front as a common factor. The square root of 4 is 2. Let's just take that out the front with the other 2. So this is 4 times the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of sine cubed theta times the square root of cos squared theta, cos theta, d theta, 
cos squared theta, the square root of cos squared theta is the absolute value of cos theta, but we're between, theta is between zero and pi over two, so cos theta is a positive number, so I can just, uh, that square root just evaporates. Um, if, if we were doing this integration over a different region, getting rid of the square root there wouldn't necessarily be quite so simple. So this is sine cubed theta times cos squared theta and theta cos squared because we've got one cos here and another cos there. And this looks familiar. Is this the uh, integral we had in the part one? Except for the four at the front, it's exactly the same. So we've already worked that out. This is four times two fifteenths. So eight on fifteen. Okay. So where have I made my mistakes this time? Uh, <laughs> well, I think you have made one. Um, I think you made a slight mistake going from here to here. It has a factor of two that didn't come with it. Here, yeah, this one? I uh, know that was there. That was from here. Uh, this one? So the x has a two side theta. So x cubed would be ah. two cubed sine cubed. Eight. Okay. All right. And 64. Better? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay, we should try a maple. We should have a maple here. Shouldn't we? <laughs> so I think this is also, I mean, if I had a choice, I mean, if I wasn't looking at the previous part of the question, I think I still probably would have chosen this just yes. because of the same thing that happened earlier. I like sine for the fact that when I do take its derivative, it is positive cosine. That's the main yeah. reason I like choosing it. I did actually want to mention something here. Um, um, uh, so I guess actually we are using x and, but that's not, not really important really for the same integral. So this thing, this is a good place to learn sort of where you make mistakes because I've learned that commonly I will make mistakes here. So I will want to double check anything I do here myself. So it's always good for me to find ways that if that if I know I am likely to make a mistake, I will find some way to check. So the way I like to check is derivatives. I can do derivatives fairly nicely, and I can usually spot the mistake now. So the minus sign is. How would I have spotted this mistake? I suppose this inter this integrated here is probably mostly more than one. Yeah, I'm not sure I would have. To yeah, be honest, yeah, this yeah. is a very subtle one. <laughs> this one is much harder, but it's important. I mean, I. Most the most important parts are done recognizing that you can get this into the what you already know, mm -hmm. then use what you know. So, yeah, um, I guess in terms of marking this, I would probably be feeling generous to maybe just <laughs> knock off half <laughs> or do something like that. Somehow, yeah. take into account that yeah, the bulk of the work, the really important. All right. Well, enough that. enough embarrassing me. Let's move. Let's yeah. move on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, all right. So you want to do the next? You can do the next one. Sure, two part B. I'll, I'll rub with the board while uh -huh. this one here. Well, um, a lot of information again. Yes. Maybe I'll start talking about that one because this this one uh, coming up, we have a um, uh, some differential equations. It's sort of modelling. Um, it's the, the the thing about this modelling question is that it's uh, some differential equations that you haven't probably seen before but you can use uh, methods um, taught in this course uh, to solve. And it sort of leads you through how to do it. Um, part one tells you to do something which actually is something done in the course. Um, uh, but it's a, you know, it's, the idea here is that it's perhaps taking a little bit out of your comfort zone because it's, um, it's not something that you've probably actually seen this particular question before, but everything in here is stuff you can do with this. One thing I'll say is that this question perhaps uh, it's more likely in a modelling question that you would be given some information and have to construct the differential equation. Sometimes the differential equation might be given to you, other times not. Um, but uh, this one's a little bit unusual because you've just been given the differential equation and not even asked at all to justify it or, or, or derive it. So probably in this exam coming up, I would expect it's more likely. Well, if it's like other ones, it's usually the case that the Maybe you've given the differential equation and asked to justify it, or perhaps not even given the differential equation and have to um, construct it from, from scratch. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. 
So yeah, Are so it's working I've done here is a little bit wrong. So uh, because I haven't used the information in the question. Right, so we do this question. Or yep. would you, like? you can you okay. can go ahead. All right. So let's see. So it, it says okay. We're given the there is a lot of text here explaining how you might be thinking about this model. But I'm going to go straight to part one. It says write down the solution of one, given the fact that we start at some x positive x naught at t equals naught. Now. The differential equation that one is modeling, this is something we already know. It is, and there is more than one way to solve this. This is a, you could write this as a linear first order equation. I have seen problems in the notes where actually they, they treat this as a, uh, a linear constant coefficient equation, which is also a nice way. I think I might just stick to the linear first order, because I know I can solve that using the integrating factor method. Can't you just, uh, is it separable as well, isn't it? Oh, it is also separable, yes. In fact, for that um, one, you can probably just write down the exponential solution straight away, I would say. Okay. Um, yeah, so. Because the, 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 for part two, it's separable, so maybe maybe just jump straight to write down the solution. Okay, so there's many ways you can spot it. One of them is you are very familiar with these equations and you just know the solution. So I might just do it that way then. We know the solution to these sort of equations. This is exponential decay. So the, this, that's uh, part one, is a model of exponential decay with solution. Now I'll do it in two steps, just because the general solution to these models is x of t is a constant, so I'm going to call this constant a, times e to the minus alpha t. So uh, there are two ways to get this. You can solve it using the fact that it's separable. I was thinking of solving it using the fact that it is actually a linear first order equation. It's also a linear constant coefficient equation, homogeneous if you write it correctly. Um, but in this case, let's just write down the solution. Now, I do need to fit this A, and actually, it will turn out, you can see that at zero, this term is very nice. This term is one, so it will turn out very, very nice. So the initial condition says, well, or maybe I would say says, it does give, it gives the following relationship that x naught is going to be a e to the naught. Now, what's nice about the exponential is it actually is 1 when you put uh, 0 in that denominator. So this is just a. So it turns out actually a is equal to x naught. I still would do it this way because other initial conditions don't start at t equals naught, uh, but this one does. So that's the solution to part one. Now we want to use this to solve equation two. It says, so using the result from part one, solve part two. And we're also given that y equals y naught at t equals naught. So first things first, let's just see what this information tells me when I put it into equation two. So using our solution from part one, we have, well, we have the differential equation. So I'm just going to say, no, let's use the full phrase, the differential equation Alright, so I'm just going to take part one, put it into part two to get that the rate of change, the y dt, is going to be equal to minus theta times x, which I already know is x naught e to the minus alpha t times y. That's theta. So what's very nice is 
this is a separable equation, as Jonathan mentioned earlier. So we can separate this and solve it. Um, it's not much space, but I'll do a little bit more down here. So this is a separable equation. And can be written as well. The typical way you'd see this written, um, well, I would I would probably write it this way. Uh, I'm looking at the integral one over y, y, and that's going to be equal to the integral minus theta x naught e to the minus alpha t. So solutions to this equation are uh, given by this equation here. So let's just, both of these are nice because we have separated and we can just do the integrals. So let's see what that tells us. Well, the exponential is easy to integrate. I get minus beta over alpha x naught t to minus alpha t. What's a constant? Now, there is a slight mistake because, again, taking a derivative, these minus signs don't match up to what I have. I do need to make that positive. So we have this as our solution, and we can take the exponential to solve this in terms of y. So y is the exponential of this, theta over alpha, uh, x naught e minus alpha t, it's a constant. And having this constant up here, well, the nice thing about the exponential of a sum you can write it as a product. I'm going to take that constant and hide it over here in an A. Oh, actually, no, A is a bad name. I already use A. Let's call it D. Alright, so that's the general solution, but we're also told to use y equals y naught for some positive y naught constant. So I do need to plug in t equals zero just to find out what I would have to pick as my arbitrary constant. And here's where it's very important that you don't just chuck y naught in because that doesn't work. So the initial condition well the initial condition that y naught equals I subscript naught gives so give us a relationship. It won't directly give us d, I think, uh, but it will tell us something. Oops, that should definitely be on silent. So what it gives us is that we're going to have y naught is equal to d times e to the beta over alpha x naught. And the exponential there still goes to 1. So this is not telling us that d is equal to y naught, it's telling us that d is going to be y naught divided by that. i.e., that is, d is going to be y naught divided by this exponential. Or if you want to write that in a slightly different way, a little bit nicer as e to the minus beta over alpha. Now, I think I'll just quickly put this back together to get y, just one expression for y. Um, then I'll work on part three. It's kind of polite to 
put it all back together. So let's do that. So y of t, our solution for y of t is going to be y naught. And what's nice is that this exponential times this exponential will combine together into e to the beta over alpha uh, x naught. And then you'll have e to the minus alpha t. Uh, and this will give me a minus 1. So it's just taking this and putting it back in. Now part 3 is saying, okay, you've solved the problem. Now find the limiting value for this yt as t hence tends to plus infinity. So really, that's saying what is happening to this term? Because this is a nice continuous function. The exponential is a nice continuous function. And this thing inside has a nice limit. So it's just going to be the exponential of that limit. So for part 3, we just need to take the limit. So for part 3, I think, yeah, just find it. Shouldn't be too hard. For part 3, the limit as t goes to positive infinity of yt is, well, we have a nice formula now. So it is the limit of this thing, y naught e to the beta over alpha x naught e to the minus alpha t minus 1. The nice thing is, if you could read it, that this e to the minus alpha t, well as t gets very, very large, this decays away to 0. So this becomes a minus 1 in here. So the limit will just be y naught e the minus beta over alpha. It's a bit small. A bit small to read? Yeah. Okay. The entire thing or just that last part? Oh. Yeah. All right. I can rewrite this. Let's rewrite the last bit larger. So we've worked out a formula. So it was y naught, the exponential. This is kind of hard using the exponential because you do put it in the power. Um, oh beta over alpha of x naught and that's multiplied by e to the minus alpha t minus 1. So the nice thing here is this thing decays away to 0 so this term here will tend to minus 1 the limit so the exponential of minus so of this thing here. So it's not a hard limit to justify you know, with e to the minus beta over alpha x naught. So I guess interesting things about this, if you did think about what the problem was modeling, so x is the number of people infected by a virus and y is the number of susceptible people in the population, that's the people who haven't yet been infected. So an interesting quick sanity check is let's say that x naught was zero. Let's say there was nobody infected in the population. Well, then that would tell you that this would be e to the zero in the limit. So it would be y naught. Everyone's susceptible because they never got infected. So that seems to make sense. I'm not sure if it would make sense if the number was very large. Uh, Yes, I think this is modeling a infinite, this is modeling a very large population. So there are there are not the other points I can think of checking. But x naught equal to naught does seem sensible. Nobody else gets infected. Okay. Uh, any mistakes you spotted? Uh, I was busy working on the other problems. <laughs> so I, unfortunately, since this isn't live, we're not able to get the feedback that we usually would. But if you have spotted mistakes, please let me know. I'll make sure to add that to any of the comments that go up when these videos are posted. Hopefully I didn't make any. Right, so is there a part C? What's part C? I think it's an exact no, I put the thing up, I'll rub this off. Okay. Yeah. Oh, maybe I'll do this one. Okay, so the next the next one we have is our, we're asked to show that the particular differential equation is exact, and to uh, then uh, 
equations. We know it's exactly we can use that method, this method of solving exact equations to find the solution. Okay, so um, exact equations, I might just uh, mention what an exact equation is. I, I need to know that in my method. An exact equation is something that's like that. And uh, this equation we have is, is a sort of expanded form of that. If h is a function of x and y, then um, this is dh by dy times by um, uh, dy by dx plus dh by dx times dh dx by dx and dx by dx is just fine, so I'll leave it like that. Okay, so our job now is to see whether the equation can be of this form. If it can be of this form, then um, we know that the if you took the x partial derivative of that, it should be the same as the y partial derivative of that, because partial derivatives commute. And so that's what we want to check. We want to check that the thing in front of dy by dx, if we differentiate with respect to x, we get we get the same thing as differentiating the thing, the other stuff with respect to y. So we need to check d by dx of what's in front of dy by dx in the equation. It's x squared y plus y cubed. We need to check what that is. And we need to check what um, d by dy of the other stuff, x squared, sorry, xy squared plus shine of 2y, 2x, sorry. All right, 2x. Okay, why did I write zero there? Uh, so we need to check these two things and they should come out to be the same. So the derivative with respect to x of this is is 2xy and the derivative with respect to y of this is 2xy. Okay, so um, these are the same, hence the equation is exact. Okay, so now now that we know that know that it's exact, we can uh, try to find what this h might be. Actually, if we could find a suitable h that made this all work, that would be that would be also a way to show that it was exact. Maybe you can just uh, you know guess it by inspection. Um, but uh, if you do, then you need to actually check that it's the right thing. Okay, so what we're looking for is um, a function h such that its y partial derivative is the thing in front of dy by dx and its x partial derivative is the other stuff. So let's just uh, write down what that means, what those equations are. So we, um, to solve for h, we need, I guess we need to solve some equations. dh by dy should be the stuff in front of dy by dx, which is uh, x squared y plus y cubed, and dh by dx should be the other stuff that's left over, which was xy squared plus shine of 2x. All right, we can try to integrate these. Um, we have to somehow make sure that our answer is consistent. If we want uh, to find an h such as partial derivative with respect to y is this, then let's integrate with respect to y, remembering of course that uh, a function of x um, is, uh, is constant uh, with respect to y. So the arbitrary constant would be a function of x. So this is going to be um, a half x squared y squared plus a quarter y to the fourth plus some arbitrary function of x. Okay. Um, if we differentiate this with respect to y, we get back to that. So let's now differentiate this with respect to x. We're taking this expression here, this expression here, and differentiating with respect to x, and then I'm going to, this partially, and I'm going to compare it to that. Okay, so this is uh, differentiating with respect to x. We're going to get uh, a half times 2xy squared. So that's xy squared. 
plus uh, zero plus f dash of x. Okay, so I took this and differentiated with respect to x to get that, and it should be the same as this. So you can pretty much see what has to happen for these two to be equal, that and that match up. Uh, f dash of x should be sine of 2x. And that tells us that f dash of x, sorry, f, sorry, integrating f of x is um, a half cosh of 2x. Have I forgotten the minus sign? Uh, no. <laughs> much, much easier. Sine and cosh are so much easier than sine and cos. Thank goodness we're doing hyperbolic functions here. Okay, so um, uh, what are we, what's the whole point of this? Um, what we're trying to do is rewrite the equation like this. Um, and then um, this is very easy to integrate because this just says that uh, that this h is a, is a constant. So, um, okay, so... Uh, that means what we have here is um, h is equal to a half x squared y squared plus a quarter y to the fourth plus a half cosh 2x. Now this is not the solution to the differential equation. This is just uh, allowing us to write the differential equation in a nice neat way that we can then solve the solution Solution to the exact ODE is um, uh, this stuff equals a constant. Okay. Um, at this point here, perhaps you could solve for y to uh, write y equals some stuff. Actually, this is a quadratic in y squared, so you could use the quadratic formula and um, and then take square roots again if you wanted. But I think it's uh, I think it's complicated enough that you probably wouldn't bother. Um, one thing I will just say is when I integrated here, this f dashed. Maybe I should have put a plus c here, a constant here, because that would also give us, uh, you know, um, an f which differentiated to this. But it's not going to change our solution in the end because that would have just added another constant on the end here and just saying that this plus a constant is another constant is, is not going to give us any extra information. So perhaps I was thinking ahead that I didn't really need the additional constant of integration here in my final solution. Yeah. So anyway, so this here is the solution to the, to the ODE. So first of all, we showed it was exact. Uh, and then we uh, solve the equation to find the h, like I've written up the top there, um, and that gives us the solution. Yeah, actually, that, just to mention that last point Jonathan had, maybe just that is a good reason not to include the constant here, because it does allow you the opportunity to say, yes, we know that this thing has zero derivative, that's what we've found, we've written it as something which has zero derivative, so that is a constant. So it allows you to say, yeah, this is giving us this. Yeah, I certainly see lots of students, they're writing a constant there and then they've got another one here and they're not sure, mm. you know, obviously if you've got two constants in here you can combine them into another arbitrary constant, but yeah, you know, it just uh, does cause a bit of confusion at times. Yes. So the constant plus a constant is a constant. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, so now that was C, that's D. Oh yeah, D is a genius. So inhomogeneous differential equation. Maybe I'll do this one as well. Okay, so now we're trying to solve a um, second order constant coefficient um, homogeneous differential equation. And the first thing to do with an equation like this is to solve the corresponding homogeneous problem. So we've got um, uh, Maybe I'll just write that out. So the corresponding homogeneous equation 
um, that's with the right hand side being zero, has, has characteristic equation. The corresponding homogeneous equation is the same equation as we have here except that the 8x becomes zero. And it has a characteristic equation which is lambda squared plus four lambda plus um, four equals zero, which of course is a perfect square. And so lambda equals two is it sorry, minus two is a repeated root. Okay, so um, so then uh, the solution to the homogeneous corresponding homogeneous equation, which I might denote as y sub h, is a e to the minus two x plus b x e to the minus two x. Because we have a repeated root, um, we've just got one solution of this form and another one which is x times that. So that's part of the uh, story. We need to, we're actually not solving this equation, the homogeneous one, we're solving the inhomogeneous one. So we now need to find a particular, uh, a solution to the, a particular solution to the full equation. So to find a particular solution, we want to basically just guess. So we call, let's call that yp, and I, my guess is going to be because we've got um, an 8x on the right hand side, my guess is going to be something that will uh, lead to uh, expressions like that when you take derivatives, and the guess would be ax plus b. Most popular uh, mistake to make here would be to leave off this b and just put a multiple of x, but uh, if you try that you should be able to see that it generally doesn't work. Um, with this particular guess, the first derivative is is a and the second derivative is zero. And so in order for this particular guess to be a solution to our original equation, what well, we just substituted in, um, and that's, um, uh, so we want yp double dashed plus four yp dashed plus um, four yp. We want that to be eight x and I'll just write down what that is here. That's zero plus four lots of ax plus b plus, uh, sorry, that should be the first derivative. Do it in the right order. Four lots of, so that's yp double dashed, four lots of yp, which is a, and then four lots of yp. yp double dashed, four lots of yp dashed, four lots of yp. And this should be equal to, maybe I'll write over the side. The whole thing was supposed to be, I'll do it here. The whole thing is supposed to be equal to 8x. And how is this going to be equal to 8x? Well, you can simplify this a little bit. Uh, well, just combine the constant terms, but you can see this is the only term with an x in it. Uh, we've got 4a equals 8. Four a on the left is the coefficient of x should be 8, which implies, of course, a equals 2. And if a equals 2, the constant term, that's 4 times 2 plus 4 times b, should be 0. And 4a plus 4b equals 0. That's the constant on the left is equal to the constant on the right. And that tells us that b should be minus 1. So I've got room to write down yp. So yp is equal to um, 2x minus 1. So far so good. Now that's uh, not the solution we're after because the, the, the solution, the general solution to the equation we want, we started with. So the general solution to the given equation is um, y is the sum of yh and yp. Is that right? So wait, b should be minus a, is that right? b should, oh sorry, b, a plus b is zero, b is minus a. 
and minus two. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. A e to the minus two x plus b x e to the minus two x plus two x minus two. There's the, there's the general solution. Now, I might point out how I noticed that last mistake, because actually with all the algebra, my head was a bit swimming. Um, so I didn't quite notice this at this point, but I did see this and think, okay, maybe I can just take it, just double check it really does work by plugging it back into the equation. So the four times yp at the beginning gives me a four x, that's uh, sorry, eight x, that looked good. But then the derivative gave me a two, and then that wasn't working, because I had a, an eight and a minus four, or and those don't sum to zero. So it is possible, especially if it's a simple thing like this, you can just quickly run it back through the equation, see if it does what you promised. We promised this would give 8x and it didn't. So, yeah, so it was a mistake. Yeah, so it's easy easy to, some, some, you can spot mistakes this way, even if the algebra, because it's sometimes a little bit hard to spot your own mistakes if you go back through your calculations. It's easier to actually say, have I done what I promised? I'll just test it, uh, if it's feasible. Yeah, <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, uh, next one. Next one is so that was D E. Uh, uh -huh. Macaron series. Okay. Should I do this or? Yep, if you like. <laughs> Probably need to speed up if we're going to finish this exam in. Yes. <laughs> Thankfully, you don't spend much time talking in an exam. In fact, you should spend zero time talking in an exam. Uh, so you will be able to do this quicker. You'll just be churning through. Um, so for part E, it says find the Maclaurin series for the cosine of 2x and state where the series is valid. Now, personally, I am happy if students just know the Maclaurin series for the cosine. I think that's what I want to know use here. Yeah, I think, yeah. We, I think we should expect you, you would know that. Yes, so we've, well, I'll say to that we've learnt, we've learnt this one, that, well, that the cosine, it's a really lovely series, in fact I might use a slightly different variable name here and say the cosine of t, can be written as 1 minus t squared over 2 plus t to the fourth, four factorial minus so on, but it can be very nicely in some actually no, notation, be written as a sum of powers, even powers of t. Uh, I might use k actually, that's more standard for this course. So even powers of t over the same thing factorial, but with an alternating sign. And it needs to, so this is going from k equals naught to infinity, and it needs to start at 1, so it's minus 1 to the k. So this is one you should know. This is a very nice way to write it down. And since they're using summation for the next part, I think it will be helpful to have it written this way. Um, and then that, the reason I think this is a very lovely series is it's for, it's, true for all t, every real number t. Every real number you put in, it actually converges. In fact, complex numbers too, but we don't talk about that. Uh, so we know this. So we can use this to find the Maclaurin series for the cosine of 2x just by replacing t with 2x. So hence there's a nice series representation. You have hence that the cosine of 2x, well, it's just going to be this series here. I might write it again into, well, no, I'll just put it here. I'm just going to take t, replace t with 2x. So we get the sum, k equals 0 to infinity, with the minus 1 to the k. This is now 2x power of 2k, and all of that over 2k factorial. And this was valid for every real number. So 2x will just be a real number, so it's valid for all 2x, valid for all x. Um, and that's sorry, not hence. So it's valid for all arguments, so that's for all x. 
in. So we have this nice series representation. Now it says here, hence or otherwise, show that this complicated looking expression is actually the power series for the cosine of x all squared. Now, the one thing I'm thinking, and I'm thinking, thinking it because I'm not going to do it, is trying to square this thing here. There is actually a formula we do teach you for how to multiply power series, which does work. It won't be very helpful here. What we really want is something which relates the cosine of 2x to the cosine of, or the, the square of the cosine. So hopefully we do remember our double angle formulas. There's a very nice one here. So for part two, I'm going to remember, uh, recall that, well, if I was looking for the cosine of x squared, I'm going to write it in my personal favorite notation, not putting the square there. What's nice is this is one half of one plus the cosine of 2x. This just comes from our knowledge of double angle formulas. And I already wrote down a formula for the cosine of 2x, so I should just be able to put that all together. Ah, I see it. So according to what I've written down, it's going to be 1 half of 1 plus the sum k equals naught to infinity is minus 1 to the k. Now, looking at what they're aiming for, I might split this into two terms. There is a 2 to the 2k, and there is an x to the 2k. All of that divided by 2k. Okay. Again, I can look at what they've written for inspiration. They start their powers, uh, they don't start with a constant term, so I might split that off. And they do bring the half in to cancel out one power here. So you can write this as one half. Well, the first term in this series is also one half. And k then k equals zero. Yeah. Never k equals zero. And then the rest. k equals one to infinity. This half will just knock out one half power, one power, one power of two from here. But just to make it look exactly like what they wrote, almost two to the two k minus one, x to the two k, all divided by two k. Factorial, and except for the fact I called it k and not n, that is the same series they told us. And they wrote a half plus a half as one, but that is what we have. And I would be happy to just say it's shown. So recall yeah. that. Just da -da -da -da. Um, and they wanted that, so it's what you wanted. It's as required. So I've shown what was demanded. So it is a bit of algebra, but it's just fairly straightforward what you get this series. Yeah. So the key, I guess the key point here is you could you could have worked out the um, power series, the Maclaurin series, because of uh, of 2x um, using the formula, but uh, if you know this and that you should know this, then uh, it's quicker. Yeah. yeah. And uh, of course, using summation notation is, is an important skill. Um, yeah, so it's, it's uh, very nice when you actually want to actually use these in the computer. You want to be able to tell it, the computer how to construct the terms for you. You don't want yeah. to do it by hand. Yeah. So I'll raise All right. this. I'll, I'll do the next one. So you want to change over the slide? So uh, here we're looking for the radius of convergence of a power series, and um, we're not asked for the interval of convergence. Um, we don't need to worry about the endpoints of the interval of convergence here. We just need the radius of convergence. You could try to um, just apply the ratio test directly to this series, and from that deduce the radius of convergence, or you could use the formula um, for the radius of convergence, which is um, given as the limit as n goes to infinity of the um, 
absolute value of an over an plus one, where I better say what these things are, um, where the series is is written as um, uh, n factorial. Sorry, maybe I'll write it out like this. This is the series as written. So the a n is the n factorial over n to the n. Okay. So I think I've got this the right way around, haven't I? Yes. Yes. So there's, if you were doing the, if you were looking to use the ratio test, then you look for a, a limit where these things are the other way up, and also these things would include the x, the powers of x in them. So slight uh, opportunity for confusion there, but this is the formula as stated in the notes. So this is the lim limit as n goes to infinity of um, well, everything in here is, these are all positive numbers, so I'm not going to worry about absolute values anymore because everything is positive and just, they just uh, give the same result. So a to the n over n, uh, sorry, n factorial over n to the n times divided by um, the same thing with n plus 1 or if you like times the reciprocal. And a lot of things here cancel out. So n factorial divided by n plus 1 factorial. Um, so we just left with an n plus 1 on the bottom. Here we've got n to the n, and here we've got n to the n, sorry, n plus 1 to the power n times another n plus 1. So this, this n plus 1 will cancel with this to provide just a single power of n, and the rest of them cancel with that. So you should check that you realize, you agree that all this cancellation occurs. And in fact, this is just n plus 1 over n all to the power n. I think everything else cancels out here. Most of the stuff cancels with these factorials and one extra, the extra bit cancels from there and we're just left with this. And this um, is now a limit that maybe you know how to do or maybe you don't. Um, it's 1 plus 1 over n to the n. This is a well-known limit. If you don't know what this limit is, you can use um, uh, well, this was in uh, Math 1131 or 1141. Uh, if you take the log of this, you'll get n times the log of this thing, which you can write as the log of this thing divided by 1 over n, and then use L'Hopital's rule. If you use L'Hopital's rule, uh, that, that, that works quite, quite easily. Anyway, this um, may be well known to be just E. So the radius of convergence here is just E. So maybe in this step here, you might need to actually calculate this limit if you didn't know it. But actually, if you do know it, we can't hold that against you. It's E. Okay, I think that's all I should say about that. Mm -hmm. um, so we're now, that's the end of question two, I think, is it? Yeah. Now on to yes. question three. Yeah. I might point out, this is actually a really lovely result people should remember, actually. In yeah. fact, I would, I would wonder a slightly more general result than that. That's when you replace it with an x. An x. That's that's probably one of the that is probably the original definition of the exponential. Yeah, the, that's right it's because it's uh, it's to do with uh, uh, instantaneously compounding interest. Yes, <laughs> I think we, we tried to talk about this back in Rule One Three One. Yeah, it's a really lovely definition. This is one thing you can do, and yeah, you can also prove this as Jonathan said. You can take the exponential of the log. The log does tend for something nice, but it, it is a lot of hard work rather than just remembering sort of the superstar results. <laughs> okay. okay, so now we're on to question three. Maybe I'll start with question three. Um, question three is now linear algebra. So I I, maybe I should have pointed out that question one in the exam was a mixture of algebra and calculus, and question two was calculus, and the question three is now algebra. So in the uh, exam this term, it'll be question one will be a mixture of the two, and questions two and three will be either algebra or calculus separately. So I don't remember which way around they go, but uh, um, this one in uh, term one was um, was algebra last. Okay, so this question here, um, we have that, um, uh, we've got a vector space V with dimension N. I might just write down some of this data more succinct, succinctly. So. Um, uh, so we've got so this is three a. So we've got a vector space with dimension n, and S is a set of um, m vectors. Maybe I'll write it like this just to 
just so I can keep track of what data we've got here. Okay, so giving reasons, state the relationship, if any, between the numbers m and n in certain circumstances. And the first one is uh, s is linearly independent. Okay, so if this set here is linearly independent, a set of linearly independent vectors, um, well, we can't, uh, it might have some restriction on how many of them there can be if you're in an n dimensional vector space. So within an n dimensional vector space, what does, the, what does this actually mean? If the dimension of a vector space is n, that means that the, uh, so I guess the largest set of linearly independent vectors is, is a set of n vectors. So this, this is saying that um, the biggest this set here could be, if they're linearly independent, would be to have n of them. So for part one, um, giving reasons, so maybe I'll, uh, yeah, so what should we say is the reason here? So it, the definition of dimension n is that the uh, largest set of linearly independent vectors, a spanning set, is, uh, is, is n-dimensional. Um, Uh, largest set of um, in an n dimensional vector space as n vectors. So uh, what am I saying here? That uh, m can't be bigger than n. m is less than or equal to n. Okay, so for part two, uh, s is linearly dependent. So if s is linearly independent, um, well, there's, there's nothing you can say there really. You can, you can, this set s could be just a, um, a vector two times that vector, three times that vector, four times that vector. It could be, you can just have as many vectors as you like that are linearly dependent in the set. doesn't matter what n is. Um, so there is no, there's no relationship there at all. Um, uh, some, I suppose you could give some examples as a reason. Uh, We can construct um, examples of S with any number of vectors, e.g., S equals V, 2V, 3V, 4V. However, however many you like, you can just, if V is a non-zero vector, maybe I should say V is non-zero. Um, then this set, is, you can just go as far as you like and it'll have as many vectors as you like. Certainly you can have, you can have a set, um, yeah. So there's no, there's no relationship between um, N and M in this case. And for part three, uh, S spans V. Okay, so if S is going to span V, then, um, well, the definition, go back to the definition of dimension being N, that means that a basis uh, has, has N vectors in it. And a basis is the smallest possible spanning set. And so we must, uh, in our set S, we've got to have at least N vectors. So. Uh, maybe a reason here would be the smallest possible spanning set or a, maybe I should say a smallest possible spanning set because it's not possible. A smallest possible spanning set for a vector space of dimension n.
as n vectors. So that's telling us that uh, this number m, the number of vectors in S, has got to be um, at least m, at least n. Could be more, but at least n. Okay. I think I'm done. Yep. I was just saying you might mention a slightly different wording from the last one I was thinking of. I was thinking another way to explain it is uh, if S is a spanning set, then it contains a basis for V. And we know how what how big a basis is for V. It's has N L elements. So if S contains a basis, it must be at least of size N, which is again to give you M is fraction that we explained. So it's another way I think to explain that why it has to be bigger than that. I might do this next one and then you can do the last ones. Alright. So this one here was a, um, a good example of a sort of question that uh, uh, is about spanning and basis and things like that and linear independence where you really do need to understand what it means to answer the question. Okay, so in this one here we've got, um, um, we've got a uh, continuous random variable uh, with a um, probability density function as given and uh, c is a constant we want to find the value of c so the first thing of course uh, you need to uh, think about here is what does it mean for the function f to be a probability density function certainly the probabilities have to be um, non-negative could be zero but or, or positive um, and um, they also must sort of add up to one the total probability of all possibilities has to come to one and so that's where we, uh, we get a result uh, that's going to be helpful in part one. So the total probability is um, the integral, uh, I guess, it's a continuous random variable from minus infinity to infinity of f of x dx must be one. So this function here is defined to be two ninths if x is between zero and one and c if x is between one and three and it's zero otherwise. So this is the same thing as the integral from um, 0 to 3 of f of x dx plus the integral, sorry, let's do the integral from 0 to zero to 1 of f of x plus the integral from 1 to 3 of f of x dx. And of course, um, I could have written down the integral from minus infinity to 0 uh, and the integral from 1 to infinity um, but of course f is zero there, so this contributes nothing. Okay, so um, so let's just uh, fill in the details here. Uh, f of x is uh, two ninths from between zero and one. So that's easy. And f of x is c when we're between one and three. Okay, so the integral from um, uh, 0 to 1 of 2 ninths, well this is just the area under the curve of height 2 ninths from 0 to 1, so that's just 2 ninths. Uh, and here this is an interval of width 2 um, of constant, so that's going to be 2c. And so we get uh, 1 minus 2 ninths is, so that's uh, 7 ninths, so um, c is, uh, I got that right? Um, so 9 on 9 minus 2, 7 ninths divided by 2, so that's uh, 7 on 18. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, so that's the value of C. Now for part 2, we want to find uh, the probability that uh, the stand, this, this random variable has a value that's less than 3 on 2. So this is the probability um, for the probability density function is just given by the area under the under the curve, and here we're interested in values uh, under the curve uh, to the left of three halves. So this is the integral from minus infinity to three on two of f of x dx, which is equal to, um, of course, between zero, sorry, between minus infinity and and one, no, 
between minus infinity and zero, f of x is zero. So this is then going to be integral from zero to one of f of x dx plus the integral from one to three on two of f of x dx. Okay, so that's, this is the area under the curve from minus infinity up to three halves. So that there is um, the value of f. The value of f. Uh, Two nights, isn't it? This, this again is just two nights, and this is um, the distance from one to three over two. These are constant functions. F is a constant in both cases. It's one here, and it's seven on eighteen there. So the distance from one to three over two is a half uh, times seven on eighteen. If if our function was more complicated than the constant, you'd have to do the integral. I mean. You couldn't just do it in your head. Okay, so this seems more complicated than I was expecting. Uh, so seven on thirty-six. Nine, two on two ninths is uh, eight on thirty-six. So eight plus seven is. Um, 15 on 36, I think. Have I got that right? It seems wrong, doesn't it? Let's see. Okay, well I'll carry on. I'll just check that. The mean the mean of x. The mean of x is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x times f of x dx. Spotted us mistake. I couldn't spot any. Yeah. Okay. Just, uh, okay. So now, um, um, the integral. So the mean is the integral from uh, over over all possible values of x times f of x, and uh, of course f of x is defined in this sort of split way, so that between or well, outside of the interval from one from zero to three, it's zero, but uh, and then from zero to one, it's two ninths, and from uh, one to three is it's seven eighths. So we just need to uh, we just need to do this uh, integral now. So this is um, one ninth x squared from zero to one plus um, uh, seven on nine x squared one to three. And this is um, one ninth minus zero plus seven or nine times three squared. Three squared is nine, so it's plus seven minus uh, putting in one plus seven and nine. So we've got um, uh, one ninth minus seven ninths, which is um, Minus six ninths, which is two thirds. Minus two thirds, so that's seven. Seven minus two thirds. That doesn't seem right. So right, doesn't it? The mean should be. The mean value should be in the. Within. The support of the function, shouldn't it? Should be between one and zero and three. Hmm. 
What have I done wrong? So the, so the graph looks like it's uh, two nights here, and then it jumps up to seven on eighteen, like there. So the, the mean value has certainly got to be within in this region here, hasn't it? Somewhere along here. Um, so which will from you know what? This is supposed to be I multiplied by two. Thirty six. Really? I should be dividing that by two. Okay, so now um, it's going to be nine here, so this is seven on four minus um, seven on thirty six. So let's put everything over 36. So that's um, 4 on 36 plus um, 7, 9 to 63 on 36 minus 7 on 36. So that's um, minus 3. So it's 60 on 36, is that right? which has got to have a factor of 6 in the top and the bottom. In fact, more than that, 12. So that's um, 5 over 3. 5 over 3 seems more reasonable, doesn't it? That's sort of somewhere here. Yeah, yeah. definitely much more reasonable than 7. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's, uh, that's the mean, the mean of x. So uh, maybe we'll call it the expected value of x, should we? And let's just, so I'll just remember that c equals, um, I'll put it in a little box here because I'm going to need it. c equals 7 on 18. And we want to calculate the variance. So there's, how are we going to calculate the variance, reckon? Not through the not first th definition. Not through the first definition. Oh, so you have to help me here. So what's the what's the um uh so what we really want to do is calculate it using the um, expected value of the square, don't we? And so what's the formula? We're looking for the which one, the original definition or the very useful one? The very useful one. So the expectation of x squared. Yeah. Minus the expectation of x all squared. All squared. <laughs> yeah, that's the way to do it, isn't it? Because the original definition of the variance is you have to um, subtract the mean and uh, and then integrate over the the uh, x minus the mean all squared. X value of x minus the mean all squared. So this is the definition we want to use. This is the thing we haven't calculated yet. Let's uh, let's do that. So. Um, So this is uh, x squared, f of x. So again, it's the integral from 0 to 1 of x squared times um, uh, 2 ninths plus the integral from 1 to 3. The integral from 1 to 3 of uh, what was our value of c? 7 eighteenths. x squared dx. So this is um, 2 on 27 x cubed from 0 to 1. And now it's going to cube. So what's, what's 18 times 3? 2 on 54. Sorry, 7 54. Is it definitely 54 on the one? Because it's twice the other one. 
Yep. Uh, so 18 times 3, yeah, that's going to be, that's right, yep. Yeah. So we've got 2 on 27 minus 0, and then uh, 3, 3 cubed is 27, 27 times 2, 54. So that's going to be 7 on 2. So we're putting 20, 27 here, minus 7 on 54. So we can put everything over. 54, so that's um, so there's two, so that's going to be 4 over 54 plus um, 7 times, so that's 27, isn't it? Seven times twenty-seven. Yeah. Hundred forty and then forty-nine. Hundred sixty-nine. Hundred eighty-nine. Hundred forty and forty-nine. Hundred eighty-nine. Yeah. Uh, actually, this, this is a good point to point out that one thing we didn't bring was our calculators. <laughs> but you are allowed to bring a calculator to the exam. Yeah. The UNSW approved calculator. Okay, so um, yeah. Okay, so this is, so we've got um, plus four minus seven, so that's minus three. So it's one eighty six over fifty four, and so the variance is uh, this one minus the square of the previous one. Twenty-five on nine is is five on three squared. Um, so so nine's going to fifty-four. Okay, don't they? So that's um so multiply by six. Yeah. Double bottom. Six times twenty-five is one fifty over nine. So over fifty-four. So that's um. 36 over 54. Uh, and there's factors of 6 in both of those, isn't there? 6 over... Well, 6 over 9, so... Factors of 9 in both, yep. Yeah. Um, 4 over... So 4 over 6, then? Yeah, 4 over 6, which is uh, 2 over 3. Yeah, it's 18. Factors of 18 in both. So two thirds. Well, that was that. It's a surprisingly nice number for yeah. uh, <laughs> after all of that. Okay. And this does seem reasonable because that's about 0 0.66 something. So the variance. Yeah. I'd expect it to be not around the one. Mark, I think. Yeah. Look at that true. picture we had before. Yeah. Yeah. So it is. Especially, it was good that Jonathan actually sort of spotted when he was doing his expectation that it came out as ridiculously large. You can't have a mean which is bigger outside distribution. It doesn't make sense. Mm. Um, not inside the simple. I'll pretend I did that on purpose. Yeah. Um, Instructive. Now, these are the calculations. Usually, we want to write an exam so you don't need to have your calculators. I think, based on what we've seen here, a calculator would be very handy for this. Yeah. Um, so there's no shame in pulling out your calculator to get this done, because um, there are these were a little bit hairy to deal with yeah. at times. So yeah, they're not impossible, but not uh, impossible, but easy to make mistakes. Yes. Right, so okay. Well, I left Josh to do the hardest questions. I think so. Uh... Uh, apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I will finish off with the last two questions, which are, again are probability questions. Do you want to go and change the the yes. slide?
So we have the No Hopers party. So it's kind of humorous the way it's worded. So we have a political party and only 6% of vote. They claim that only 6% of voters support them. So they really are No Hopers. And in a survey, they say 500 people were asked about them. And we want to try and model this situation. Let's say we did this survey and we want to say it's a random process. We're asking people uniformly at random uh, what kind of model would give this sort of distribution and well, it actually even tells us it will be a binomial distribution so we need to just find the mean and variance so let's let's just set the notation so x is a random variable given by a number of voters in the survey who support the Australian no voters party so uh, now, they do already set all the notation, so I'm just going to use the notation and say that we have the following. We have x, and this notation is used in your lectures, I have seen it. So x is distributed like, and it's distributed like a binomial distribution. Now, I think it's understandable to say it's binomial, and we're sampling, so our taking sample size of 500 and the probability of actually finding somebody who does say yes they support well they're claiming that this is 0.06 this is the chance of success so finding somebody who really does support them now what they do tell us to do is for this find the mean and find the variance now you don't want to have to do the calculations for this for this one you have to actually know the formulas for the binomial distribution so we've learned, and again, this is just something we have to learn. You can prove it. The proofs are quite nice, but you don't want to have to go through the proofs in the exam. So we've learned that the expectation of a binomial distribution, it's actually just the sample size times probability of success. This kind of makes a lot of sense. So this is uh, going to be 500 times, well, I can either write as 0 0.06 or as 6 out of 100. I might do 6 out of 100, just because I can see hundreds that cancel. And it's 5 times 6. So, so far, I think I did get the easier question. <laughs> um, and the other thing we've learned is actually the variance. So the variance of x. Um, well, it's another formula that you know, and it's really lovely because it's actually n times the probability of success um, times the probability of failure, that confident probability. So this is a formula you will just have to know. It kind of makes sense to you that when, so if one of these numbers is close to zero, for example, if you always succeed, there's very little variance in success. You always get the same sort of result, and there's very little variance in always failing. So it, intuitively, you can kind of feel that this formula might be right. But here it is uh, 500 times now probability of success 6 over 100, which means the probability of failure is 94%, but I'm going to write that as 94 over 100. Now I think it's a little bit harder. So this is 5 times 6 times 94 over 100. So I know this is already 30. I wonder if I can just do it by hand. 30 times 94 over 100. Well, I'm not sure I can do much better than just... I can get rid of a 10 to get 3 times 94 over 10. Uh, one more simplification. These obviously both have multiples of 2. So 3 times... Uh, 45 and 2 is 47, 47 over 5, and so 3 times 47, because that's not too small, it is a bit small actually, so so far I'm at 3 times 47 over 5, and well, 350 is 150, so I'm going to be another... Uh, nine short of uh, 
Yeah, we're not short of that. So 141 over 5. Does that seem right? No, oh, no, but it's out of 500, so um, that does seem okay. All right. So what's important here, and I definitely do think I need a calculator for this because I'm going to, uh, yeah, I think I definitely need a calculator for this. So survey results are published, and it's found that 22, oh, thank you, that 22 of the 500 people support the Australian No Hopers. So we want to use a normal approximation to this binomial approximate estimation to find out what is the pro to estimate the probability that x is at most 22. And then we'll come to a conclusion. So these numbers are important. So this expectation and this variance, very important for what we're about to do. Um, let's see that. It's a very long question, so. Let's just remind myself what we found so far. So I have the expectation of my binomial distribution. Well, that was just 30. And the variance, not as pretty, but 141 over 5. That had the nice decimal expansion, so it's 141 times 0.2. So I guess I could write it as 28.2. Not that bad, that's what. Um, now we want to use a normal approximation. So, okay. So I might get rid of this, those other calculations, and we can work on part two. So, for part two, well, what's very nice is actually this x can be approximated using a binomial distribution. So we, oops, not ye, ye can. So we can approximate. And we can approximate x by y, which is a normal distribution. So I'm going to put a y normal of a certain mean, in this case mean 30, and a certain variance. So the variance, or the square of the standard deviation, was what we calculated. So we can, this is a reasonable approximation we've learned how to make. But what we want here is, what is the probability that x is less than or equal to 22? So we're looking for the probability that x is less than or equal to 22. Now, because I'm about to approximate this with a continuous random variable, because this is continuous, I'm just going to say this is the same as the probability that x is less than or equal to 22.5, or less than 22.5, because it is discrete. But this can be nicely approximated by probability that y is less than or equal to 22.5. Now, I've seen a lot of people ask, do I need to do this continuity correction? Uh, I think it's a wise idea, but it's not wrong to do. So, and it's better, it's more yeah, accurate. It's a little bit more accurate to sort of do it this way. So what's nice is this is a normal distribution. Now, unfortunately, I don't have any information about this particular normal. But I do have information about the standard normal. So this can be written as the probability that y minus 30 over, well, in this case over the square root 28.2 is less than or equal to 22.5 minus 30 is less than, sorry, over the square root. I'm just sort of reshifting this inequality into this. And that will be a probability about a new thing I'm about to call z being less than or equal to. And I will need a calculator for this. I will need to find a decimal approximation for that. But this is not <laughs> UNSW approved, but I could use it. I think Jonathan's doing something kind. Oh, no. I, was, I wasn't actually. 
Alright, let me try this. Alright. Now I should explain what Z was. So it's not polite to just pull out names uh, for things. Uh, so here Z is a special distribution. It's called the standard normal. So it's normal with mean, zero, and variance one. Now what's nice about this is there is actually a table in your exam. Should we show them the table on the screen or just... Do you have it? It is there. Oh, I don't know how to go. How do I change that? It's image number 18. So I can bring it up if you like. Yeah, how do you do that? Change the image. Alright, so we have this table. I'll put it down somewhere. <laughs> So you have this table. Now what's nice about this table, it does contain a lot of information about st uh, probabilities of as the standard normal. Now on this, we're looking for the probability that this standard normal is less than minus 1.412. Now this can only really handle up to two decimal places of accuracy, so we, we are going to round here. And just look at the table and say it looks like it's in the Fourth row, sorry, the fourth set of rows. Yep, right at minus 1.4. Four. I get minus 4. Point. So it's a second entry in, so I'm getting 0 0.0793. I get uh, here uh, from the table. Probability that x is less than or equal to what we're looking for, 22, is approximately 0 0.07. 0 0.07. I lost it. No, sorry. So it's about 8% in this one part. So part three is we have to interpret this. So it does it provide clear evidence that the actual support is less than the 6% they claim. So it could be that you might think it's lower. So last question, does this provide clear support? So really what the question is asking is, is this incredibly out of the ordinary? So we got a result, and in fact it's, it's lower than you might have expected, because you expected there to be, the mean was 30. You expect there to be 30 supporters around on our, on our average. Uh, we got less than 30, so I think maybe this is unusual, maybe they're actually even more hopeless than they originally claimed. Well, with a probability at about 7 or 8 percent, that's not really low, like, it's, this could have happened just by chance. So we would say here that it's not sufficient evidence for a discrepancy. Yes, it was low, but it's still not that unusual. So the standard we take for this course is because, well, 7.93 percent is greater than 5 percent, um, we think this could just have happened by chance. So it does seem unusually low, but it's not really that uncommon. That is, it does not. Oops. Provide evidence um, yeah, of lower support. So yeah, so that last part, you do need to understand what we're taking as evidence here. So we're thinking 
This was an unusual thing to happen, that uh, it was lower than the 30 they usually claim. If it was much greater than the 30, you might start to think maybe they're actually have more supporters than they claim. He was saying, no, their claim is pretty consistent with the evidence we've found. So there's no evidence that they're incorrect. Have any comments? I think that's all right. All right, so the very last one, it's another probability question. And we have this no-name university where students are made to take ad administration courses in term one, term two, and term three. And it says here that actually, regardless of whether you pass or fail, you still get to take the other courses, so you still get a chance to pass the rest. So after running this for a year, they've found some, they found the following facts. They have that 70% of the students actually pass the first course. Um, and well, you can read the rest, but to start this off, I think I want to give these events names. So let's actually start by letting, well, let's A be the event that student, a student passes administration 111. So let A be the event of passing first course. Well, we have two other events. You could now pass the second course or pass that. No, pass the second course or pass the third course. So let's name these. So B, B, the event of passing administration or ADMM 2222. And finally, well, let's just keep alphabetical. C will be the event of passing the third course. Passing. Oh, sorry. Passing administration 3333. Now we have to work out exactly, well, for all the information given, what proportion pass administration third course, but um, regardless of how they got there. So I actually like to take this sort of information because there's a lot of information here in dense text. I actually like to take it and write it in a more algebraic way using the conditional probability. So I might just write this information down and then we'll use it to construct the tree diagram that we want. So we're told that Well, we're told that the probability that a student passes the first course is equal to 0.7. There's a 70% chance that a student comes in and passes the first course, which of course tells us that the probability that they fail the first course is 30%. So 30% the of the students actually has to fail. Now the next part actually tells us about how a student performs relative to their first performance. So we have some conditional probabilities. We have that the probability of passing the second course, given the fact you passed the first course, well, according to this, uh, that is 60%. So more than half of these students are actually going to pass the second course, which means the probability that you fail the second course, given that you pass the first one, is 40%. So 40% of these students would fail. And there's more information provided here, which is that the probability of passing the second course, given the fact that you unfortunately failed the first one, well, that is only 40%. So only 40% of these students will pass. And that tells you that uh, of this group who failed the first course, you would get 60% of these students failing. So failing the first course is kind of an indicator for failing the second course if you read the map. And there's two more things I need. And that's from this last paragraph. So let's just get this information. So it says that of students who pass the second course, 30% will pass the third course. And this doesn't actually depend on their behavior 
in the first course. So what we have is, we have that the probability of passing the third course, given the fact that you passed the second course, well, there's two things I actually say here. They say, actually, it's the same for a student who has passed the first course as it is for a student who failed the first course. All of all, it's saying this is independent. It doesn't matter how you behaved in the first course. You have a 30% chance of passing the third course. And you can also work out now what is the probability of failing this course given the fact you passed. So I might just leave that and write down the one more piece of information, which is what is the probability you passed the third course given the fact that you failed the second course. And again, it says that this probability is independent of the first course. So whether or not you pass the first course or fail the first course, you don't, it doesn't actually matter. This probability will be the same. That's why it says regardless of your performance. So in this case, it says that of those who fail the second course, only 10% of these are going to pass. So a very low proportion of those students actually pass which means the remaining 90% remaining of these students fail. So this is all the information written nice and algebraically, but to really see what's happening, a tree diagram is really the way to sort of see it all being constructed. So let's take all this and put it into the tree diagram. So I'm still going to use the notation I introduced. I'm going to let A, B, and C be the events passing the first course, second course, and third course. And let's just see, let's put all this information in and see what happens. So we have, well, students come in and they either pass or they don't pass. And according to this, we have 70% passing, 30% failing. And then, well, of these students who passed, we find that, well, 60% of these will also pass the second course, while 40% of these will fail. So, they will not pass the second course. And this group is slightly different. So you find that actually this group here, only 40% of these students will pass, while 60% of these students Will fail. So this group and this group have, oops, sorry, these students have failed. They have a slightly different probability. And the last part is what we worked out is what happens next. So it says here, actually, for these two groups, it's the same. So when you, if you have passed the second course, you have a 30% chance of passing the third course. So it's saying that 30% chance that you actually will also pass the third course. And that means 70% of these students uh, will not pass the third course. Now, it's, and that's, a, uh, that's the same as this group down here. So apparently this group has the same behavior. If you pass the second, it tells you 30% chance you pass the third, and 70% chance you're going to fail the third. Now, the other group, those who failed the second, they only have a 10% chance of passing. So this group here, these two groups apparently behave the same. They both have a 10% chance of passing. So that means a 90% chance that this group will just outright fail the third course. And the same for this group, a 90% chance that they will fail. So now we can work out these probabilities. So let's work out well, let's just work them all out so we can see what's going on. So we want the probability that a student has passed. I'll make that bigger so it's more legible. We're looking for the probability that they pass all three. Now, that's going to be 
70% of 60% of 30%. Now we can calculate this by hand. If you have a calculator, that would help a lot. But 70.7 times 0.6 will be 0.42. And 0.42 times 0.3 will be, uh, I need to calculate this, I think. So I should have brought my Unis W approved calculator, but I will use my phone to do Unis W approved calculations. <laughs> and we'll get the same answers. So we're looking for 0.7 times 0.6 times 0.3, so that's 0.126. So in total you'll only find 12.6% of the entire population was lucky enough to pass all three courses. Um, so the other one, let's do 0 0.7, 0 0.6 times 0.7 you'll find that uh, the probability that you pass the first two but unfortunately failed the third one, well that's going to be 0 0.294. So almost 30% of students end up in this category here. We can follow the others. So it's be 0 0.7 times 0 0.4 times 0 0.1. So let's do 0 0.7 times 0 0.4 times 0.1, and I get the probability that you pass, then fail, then pass, no, the probability that you pass, then you fail, then you pass, well actually only 0 0.028, so that's the probability, so it's about almost 3%, 2.8% is what that says. Uh, we can do this other calculation. You find actually there are more students in the pro there are more students which would have passed, then failed, and then failed again. This is about zero point two five two. And we can keep this up. So we'll look at the rest. So we have probability of failing, but then two passes. Then you have to fail. Then you have to pass twice. So that's 0 0.3 times 0 0.4 times 0 0.3 again. So here we have 0 0.036, that's 3.6%. We have the probability that you fail, then pass, and then fail again. That'd be 0 0.08. Two more, that's you could fail twice, then pass once. The probability that you are going to fail the first two courses, and then you make a recovery and pass the third one. Well, that's going to be 0.3 times 0.6 times 0.1. Now, that one I could probably do in my head, but since I've already got the calculator out, let's just do it this way 0 0.018. And well, actually, this last one is just going to be what's left over, but it's easier still to calculate it, I think. So we're looking for the probability, it's going to be 0 0.3 times 0 0.6 times 0.9. So it's 0 0.162, that's 16.2%. Now, if you had time, which I don't think we really would because this is already a lot of writing, you could check this by summing up all these numbers, these all would add up to 1. That's the law of total probability. Okay. So question one. So we need this information. We want to know what proportion of students actually passed the third course. And there are four different groups who passed the third course. So for question one, we're looking at the people who always passed, the people who unfortunately failed the second course but passed everything else, the people who unfortunately failed the first course but passed everything else. And finally, the people who failed everything except for the last course. So these are all the students which passed all the courses. So now it's easy because we know how what percentage of students are in each group. We just add it all up. So 
we can say from the tree, we see that, well, the probability or proportion of students who just pass the third course is the sum of these numbers. So it's the sum of all these numbers, which is this. So 0 0.126 plus 0 0.028 plus 0 0.036. And finally, this one, 0 0.0. 018. So just to make it a bit clearer, that was this number, the students who passed the third course and everything else. This number, students who passed only the first and the last. This number, because you passed the second and the third. And finally, you only passed the third. That's the only way it can happen. Everything else, everyone else failed the third course. And I do think that's quite nice as an answer, but this is something we could calculate. Again, this is not too hard to do by hand, but to make sure I do definitely get it right, I'm going to calculate it. I'm going to use an approved calculator method. So, so according to this, if I've done this correctly, it's the probability that we just pick a student and they pass the third course is 0 0.208. You're saying 20% of the entire population actually passes, well about 20%, 20.8, pass the third course. All right, so that's part one. Part two is, of those who actually did pass this course, so we will need this number, so I might just write this down so I don't lose it. I really need to remember that the probability of just passing the third course, no other information, is 0.208, 20.8%. So we want to work out, okay, of these students, what's the probability that they also pass the first course? So we do need these numbers, I'll leave these numbers up. Of those who passed the third course, what proportion passed the first? So part three, I would read it as the probability, so the or proportion, of students who passed the first course, given the fact we know they passed the third. So it's of these students, what proportion passed the first? Now, this is very nice because you can write this as the probability that they pass both divided by the probability that they pass the last one. Now you can think of this as, this is really just a fraction, so I'm saying what fraction of this population also passed, the th uh, sorry, what fraction of the population who passed the third course also passed the first? And we don't have this written down just yet, but all the information is here, because students who pass the first and the third, well that's these students up here, and these students here, these all failed the, the first, so they're, they're not included. So it's these two groups we need to use. So, just written algebraically for now, it is going to be made up of those students who passed all three, and the number of students who actually only passed the first and passed the last. And all that's divided by those students who passed the third. So these two numbers are here. You have 0 0.126 and you have 0 0.028. And all of that divided by this number I kept, 0 0.208. So that can be written, this one I'll just do in my head, it's 1.54. So 0 0.154 over 0 0.208. Now it looks like 
there's a common multiple I could get rid of. To me, this seems okay. I might just leave the S like this. You might want to try and pull out multiples you want to look a little bit nicer, but that's pretty good. I think I like the way that works. So that's part two. And part three, part three is, are the events passing the first course and are the events passing the second course independent? So, and we also need to give reasons. We can't just say yes or no. We need to explain why we think that. Okay. So let's just start this problem. I don't need this number anymore because we're not even thinking about the third course. Uh, I don't think these are helpful because, well, they could be helpful. I'll leave them up just in case. Uh, let me try and rephrase the question first. So it says, are they independent? So really the question can be restated like this. Is the probability of passing the first course and passing the second course equal to the probability of passing the first course times the probability of passing the second course. So if they're independent, this will be true. So this is our question. And we can calculate these. We can calculate what this number is, and we can calculate these two numbers, and then just compare if it's equal. So that's all we really need to do, calculate these two numbers. Now this one is nice because we were told this one. This one we will have to calculate. Um, so, yeah, and this one, well, it might be better to construct a new tree, but we also need to know this one. So, from the information provided, well, okay, this one here, probability of A and B, well, it's the probability of B given A times the probability of A. This is just conditional probability. So this is always true. This is a, just a true fact. And what's nice is we were told these numbers. So we were told that the chance of passing the second course, given the fact you passed the first, that was up before, but it is 60%. Passing the first course, so we have a 60% chance of passing the second, and you just have a 70% chance of passing. So 6 times 7 is 42, so this is 0 0.42. All right, so we know this number. I'm also told this number, that was a 0, actually I used it here, 0 0.7. So I need to work out this one. What is the probability of passing the second course? Now there are two ways to pass the second course. So we want the probability of passing the second course. And there's two distinct ways you can do that. You could be a really super student and pass both. Or you could have an unfortunate first term and you could fail first. Now we already know how to calculate these two numbers. This one I just calculated actually, that's the number here. We know that 0 0.42 of students, so you have, there's a 42% chance you just pass both courses. And for the second one, well, that means you would have to be a student who failed the first course times the chance that you pass the second. So that is the chance that you pass the second, given you failed the first, is six, uh, 40%. Yeah, so only 40% of these students are actually going to go on and pass the second course. So that is... 0 0.42 plus 0 0.12, which is 0 0.54. All right, so I have all the information I need. Now I can just do my check. All right, so because, well, what is the probability of A times the probability of B? Well, probability of A is actually told to us. You have a 70% chance of passing the first course. 
And probability of B, well, just without any other information, you have a 54% chance of passing the second course. Now again, well, this is a little bit beyond my capabilities of mental arithmetic, so I will pull out my calculator and say it's 0.7 times 0.54. So according to this, the product of these two numbers, whoops, so the product of these two numbers is 0 0.378. Now, that is not the same as this number. This number we worked out here is 0 0.42. The chance that you just passed both courses is 0 0.42, and it doesn't equal the product of these two probabilities. So that does not equal 0 0.42. So they're not independent. If they were independent, this would be true. So that's our conclusion. Hence, uh, yeah, so hence I'll just say A, the two names I gave them, A and B are not independent events. Okay, so thank you for keeping with us for the entire live stream. Unfortunately, well, Jonathan did have to go, and you may notice I am wearing different clothing because this last question was recorded the day after. So. Um, so good luck with your final exam and we'll see you, well hopefully see you around the maths department.